Garth Craven, Roger Spottiswood, and Tony Lawson uh, all owe their, no, not Tony Lawson, but Garth Craven and Roger Spottiswood owe their transition from England to America and from uh, London to Hollywood uh, to Sam, because Garth Craven and Roger Spottiswood were the editors on Straw Dogs, together with Tony Lawson. When Sam was hired by Joe Wazan to, to direct Junior Bonner in Prescott, Arizona, he had to um, leave Straw Dogs immediately after we, sh we finished shooting, because we had to shoot Junior Bonner around an existing uh, rodeo that uh, started in June or July, I can't remember, it's a long time ago. Roger Spottiswood and Garth Craven came to America because Sam took them to Prescott, Arizona to edit Straw Dogs while we were shooting Junior Bonner. And Garth Craven continued to be an editor and Roger Spottiswood uh, went on to direct. And Garth Craven ed edited almost all of Sam's films while he was here. In Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, there is a shot where uh, Pat, uh, Pat Garrett shoots himself in the mirror um, because, of, because of the real, realization of what he's doing to Billy the Kid, and, and he shoots himself in the mirror. And Sam was practicing that shot um, in his own bedroom in the house where he was living in, on Pat Garrett. Um, just as uh, Garth Craven was coming through the door, he was actually shooting at the at the uh, the mirror. He wasn't shooting at the uh, um, at the door, but uh, Garth unfortunately was just coming through the door at the time. I, it, 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 I mean, Garth was being uh, humorous when he said it almost uh, ruined their relationship, but it wasn't. It was it wasn't in anything personal. It was just Sam practicing a shot that was later going to be in the film, as you know. Again, when, when Sam found in someone, you know, that he wanted to work with, uh, both as a friend and, uh, as a, and as a professional, Garth Craven was one of them. He was always there for Sam. He was one of the, the ones who survived the Peckinpah legacy. Gus, can we talk about um, the, uh, your first experience of working with Sam and seeing all this sort of mountain material arriving in, in the cutting room? And what, what your reaction was to that? And, uh, yeah. and the fact that you perhaps thought that, that was how it was? Well, um, yeah, I'm, Sam was the first person that I actually cut film for. I, I'd worked as a sound editor prior to that. I worked with a sound editor for Sam also. But he gave me my break as an editor. So really, whatever I did was, um, it was all fresh to me. That was, that was where I learned whatever it is I know. Um, but anyway, the fact was, that was on Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, uh, which had a lot of film on it. People, people used to talk about Sam um, as shooting a lot of film. It was one of the legends of Hollywood at the time. It was one of the things people liked to hear stories about how much and how many Dale is and how much do you have to sit and watch at night and so forth and so on. Um, it was a lot. Um, it's hard to think in terms of numbers, but... Dailies would go on for hours. There were multiple cameras, there were multiple takes. He printed a lot of film. But that was fine by me because that was, this is, um, that was all I knew. This is, this was my first look at it all and this was the way films were made. And so, um, it may have been a lot of film, but what the heck? I, I didn't know what a little film was like, so, so that was, uh, but out of that, you realised that he was actually working towards mining the gold from a, a lot of ore, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, well, that's, that's what I, I, I decided was, was the reason for it, and it makes sense, and it's probably something that came out of talking to him as well. I don't specifically remember the conversations, but in any way it worked in that fashion, um, in that... Um, 
obviously the more raw material you have, you, you increase the odds of those little nuggets that you're looking for. And that was very often the way that Sam talked about approaching scenes, about approaching the material, was look for those nuggets, look for those moments, moments he talked about a lot, look for the gold in it all. And um, with more raw material, more ore, you, you, you would hope to find those little nuggets of gold. Um, and it did work that way. Uh, it must have required a great time and perhaps studio time and an effort beyond what was normal for those, t for those days. Well, of course, yeah. If you have more film to look at, it takes longer. And, of course, if you've got all that film, you can't just slough it off and say, well, I don't have time to look at it. You've got to look at it and you've got to pour over it and you've got to look at it again and again and again and again with all those choices. That's the only way to approach it. And, of course, in filmmaking, as in many other things, um, time is a major consideration and uh, um, the studios had problems with that. Um, it meant that the editing process inevitably was a lot longer generally than they were used to. Um, it also meant that um, in order to stop that time factor running away, because there were schedules, there were deadlines that had to be met, there were release dates and so forth and so on. The only other way to approach it was by having more people than normal to handle all of that material. Um, so post-production with Sam was something that wasn't a standard post-production by any means. It was, uh, it took more time, and when the time ran out, it took more people. And uh, this, this did cause problems for him, with the studio, certainly. Um, your relationship started then as a sound editor and then you moved on to start to cut with him. What, um, and uh, I'd like to hear a bit about that relationship, but also, I mean, did you see his, his evolution as a director? Were there ways that he changed as well during your relationship? That's hard to say. Um, I'm not sure that I see an evolution there. Uh, the different pictures were approached in different ways, perhaps. For our audience, perhaps you could tell us of the films that you worked on with Sam, and then move on to Alfredo Garcia as being the, you know, the, the film you think is perhaps one of the most personal ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I met Sam on Straw Dogs in England. Um, after that came The Getaway. Uh, I did both of those as sound editor, then moved on to become his editor, uh, one of his editors, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Um, then Alfredo Garcia, Killer Elite. Then I missed one. And finally, the last film I did with him was Convoy. Um, as to Alfredo Garcia, it's, it's a very strange, dark and quirky film, but for me, it's one of the films that I, in a way, was proudest of. And one of the films that I thought was a film that Sam did for himself. It was one of his most personal films um, that had the least in it of, of being a Hollywood picture. It was shot outside of Hollywood. It had a very non-Hollywood feel, and um, it... Um, Was it, was it something also to do with the character of the Warren Payne? Well, yes. Um, yeah, I did, there, there is the fact that, that uh, as I was saying, that um, Warren really, it's, it's, to see the picture again, it's a, Warren really was playing Sam. And, and one of the odd things about that was that... Um, I'm not sure that Sam actually picked up on that, or if he did, he was one of the, the last in line to do so. It became apparent to most of the rest of us earlier that um, that he was uh, that this was what it, in fact Warren was doing. That he on screen was was Warren's interpretation of Peckinpah, and um, which was the way it should have been. It seems to me because it was a very personal piece. It was. Uh, a piece not about Sam but from Sam's heart. Did you see those parallels as you were looking at the material? Mm. 
No, it's it's not it's not a question of it being um, a picture about of about Peck and Pa or, or about aspects of Peck and Pa's life or anything like that. It's it's a film that's got to do with themes and moods and attitudes, which are are our sounds, which which most closely echo who I think Sam was. Could you tell me what those themes and attitudes? Uh, are and were. Mm. Well, the, the whole tone of the picture, um, it had to do with, it seemed to me, with um, a lot of the the stuff that, that that Sam related to, saw in himself. It was the existentialist hero, anti-hero. It was the, the Humphrey Bogart character. It was... Um, it was Albert Camus, it was Jean-Paul Sartre, it was that area of, of life that um, was Sam certainly knew and appreciated through his reading and I think fantasised on a personal level as being in that world. Um, so there was that attitude in it certainly that, uh, that makes it a very personal picture. Um, there are other things too. It's it's, it's a picture that very clearly, I feel, is, reveals Sam's ambivalence to the whole situation, of um, the men-women relationships. Um, and it's, in the film, it's a very confused relationship. Isela Vega, is, um, the attitudes towards women expressed in the picture are, are by no means clear and coherent and I think this is this is part of Sam too and it, it, it runs the gamut of sentimental love and attachment of the whore with the heart of gold um, all of these rather stylized notions of women that I think were part of Sam's life and the violence too is is it's no longer poetic. It's very real and extremely unpleasant. Do you have any feelings about that? It's a very dark film. Certainly is. Um, it's a pessimistic film. It's black, and there is not much hope. And and the violence is a reflection of that. Certainly. Could we talk a bit about <coughs> Pat Garrett being sort of like a permanent crisis? Which it was. It was Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid was um, was a crisis from beginning to end. It seems, um, and it uh, ended up a really major crisis. And was taken away from Sam and um, released in the, the the studio's version. But the crises went on and on in that picture. There are far too many to go into them all. Um, I had my own crises on the picture. It was the first film that I edited, rather than sound edited. I started off the picture being sick as a dog, and got over that one, but there was a moment sometime in the middle of shooting, and I can't remember specifically how far along. I remember Sam had been very sick. He had pneumonia, there were all kinds of problems with the producers, with the studio, equipment, everything. Um, he'd been told he couldn't shoot scenes that he must have for the picture to work, and then uh, endless crises, as I say. Anyway, um, he called over to the cutting rooms on one occasion, I remember, um, to have us go over there and, and visit him in the house he was renting in Durango. He normally could be found holding court from his bedroom, from the bed. And um, I went over and climbed the stairs to go and speak with Sam. And um, as I stepped through the door, there was a ear-shattering explosion, which turned out to be a, a gun being fired, a pistol being fired, which was Sam was firing at the, an enormous mirror at the bottom of the bed, which, of course, was reflecting him, reflecting himself. That was of no real interest to me, and what was of interest to me was that somebody had just fired a gun in 
a room where I was standing some few feet to my left. And um, the first and only time I've ever been near a gun being, being fired, and it was also probably the only time that I ever lost my temper around Sam. And um, that was not part of our relationship, but on that occasion it was. I, I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but yelled something about if he ever did anything like that again, I was going to come over there and kill him. So, But, um, of course, um, it's an obvious point, but an interesting one is that uh, that scene, of course, crops up in, in the film itself, in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And James Coburn, at the end of the film, after shooting, um, Billy turns and shoots himself in the mirror. It's, um, that, of course, was when the dailies came in on that, which was not a scripted scene. It was something that was invented on the set. You know, it struck chords with my own incident with Sam. But, um, but this was the case with Sam all the time. And, and watching his films and being around him. Um, the constant sort of feeling of life imitating art, or where did one stop and where did the other begin? Sam was always talking in terms of lines from the movies, as we all did eventually, but also the movies were also full of lines, which when you knew Sam, were Sam on screen. And um, so there was this constant flux where life ended and the screen began. Illusion and reality were, were not um, too clearly defined in Sam's life or the experience of working with him. Um, you said once to me that you felt that perhaps his life was a, one great performance. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? I, I think that most people who spent time around Sam must have got the feeling, as I certainly did, that his life was a grand, was a continuous performance. He was, he was an actor. He was playing a role. He was, um, everything was, was, had that feeling about it. That somehow, that every moment was being staged and that Sam was delivering dialogue created to create an effect in some sort or other. It was a very confusing way to be with someone. Because here, of course, you were being asked to play a scene in which you had no idea what the story was, and only he, only his half of the dialogue had ever been written. So it was, um, it could be very unnerving, and I think that was all part of it too. Sam enjoyed unnerving people, putting them in a position where they were ill at ease. I think the idea of ease was anathema to him. Certainly for other people, probably himself, he, he was constantly breaking that down, keeping people on the edge. Do you think that that was part of whatever private demon or demons drove him? That he, ne he needed to be on the edge, so he had to put other people on the edge too? It's very possible, yes. That, that could certainly be the case. He was not a man who, who was well in repose, generally speaking. Then this is... Having said that, there is also the... He was a complicated man. Anything you say about Sam instantly, you realise that the opposite is also true. And you can, you can think of other things, other examples of his behaviour that just go the other way. Um, Sam could be a quiet, gentle, contemplative man too. Um, those were moments that I knew with him. Um, outside of the making of film, and, and just in terms of our friendship together. Um, but those were small, private moments in, in his larger life and his public life, I think, that um, he probably did need to keep an edge, and to keep an edge on those around him, and I'm sure he believed that um, that, that was how he got the best work out of a lot of people. That way, was that way, and the best work out of himself, that way. You, you told me too about the fact that you became so close that there was almost a marriage contract or worse that effect. Can you tell me about that? Yes, well, 
apart from doing a, a lot of films together, um, Sam and I became very close personal friends. Um, we virtually lived in each other's pockets for the best part of 10 years. Um, even so much that at one point, I remember it was at the end of uh, Killer Elite, um, when Sam was planning his next film and he was talking about us doing it and uh, together, and he said, um, you know, Garth, you and I are married. We're a couple, we're married. Well, I hadn't quite seen things this way, and, and I thought that if, if that was the case, it was probably time we had a divorce, and, and in mm. fact, I didn't do the next film with him. Um, though it didn't turn out to be a divorce, it turned out to be a separation, and in fact, we were a lot closer after that period than we had been before, probably, both in the working relationship and as friends, but um, that kind of relationship was, was, was um, the kind of relationship that Sam inspired, I think, that if you got close to him, you got very, very close to him. It implies, too, not making any homosexual, you know, uh, allegations or anything like that, which I would, don't believe, but there was a feminine side to him, perhaps, was it? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I don't think that... Um, that that implied a homosexual relationship certainly didn't in my case, and neither in Sam's. But um, there was undoubtedly the, the 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 other side of Sam to the the well-known macho Western image that was projected. As um, I said before, almost anything you said out about Sam, the opposite was also true. And in that case, it's certainly so that there was there was a very gentle feminine side. Um, the side that um, probably had to do with his love of sunsets, with his um, his love of poetry, his love of reading, uh, his love of language, the King James version of the Bible. I remember hearing him read just for the sheer pleasure of the language. Um, his love of nature and changing weather, all of those things, which were not part of the normal image of, of Sam, the macho Western man. How do you remember him? How do I remember him? I remember him very clearly as an image, a wiry little figure, grey, with a moustache, tough and enigmatic, um, not quite knowing what he was thinking at any given moment. Um, remember him with a great deal of love and just with a sense that here was a man who shaped my life probably as much or if not more than any other.